Okay, I hope this is recording. Uh, the picture does seem awfully small. I'm not sure why it's shrunken down, but here we are in Math 1101, and this is the recorded lecture that replaces the Monday and Tuesday lectures um, of this following week. And so let's get into what we talked about uh, before, the exponential growth and decay. I wanted to just quickly review it. Uh, before we continue with new stuff. And uh, yeah, we, we talked about all this before, but uh, 3.2 talks about the definition of an exponential function. I spent some time on 3.1 and talked about how uh, the straight line is just different than the uh, curve that 3.2 shows up. My, the picture is so much smaller than before. I'm not sure what's gone wrong with this, but let's just keep going. They had the tripling. We had the first formula is pretty good. The second formula I don't have much use for. Uh, we talked about the 7% growth and all that kind of thing. Man, the picture is so tiny. I don't know why it's just tiny. So I apologize for that. We need to work on some stuff. Things have changed ever since the uh, last one I did in November. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we just to refresh your memory, we did go through the 7% increase every year times the year's balance. And we talked about an initial value being 800, a base being 1.07. That gets you your 7% interest we talked about. And uh, that's now the base because you keep the amount with the 1, and the 0.07 is the extra amount for every time t, typically done in years. So we're going to keep the years going. And they're going to say 10 years as we finished up last time. And, of course, calculate, calculate this number first. It was about 1.96. And that's about double, and see the number is about double the 800. The 800, of course, gets multiplied last. So anyway, pick up where we left off and continuing this example. Uh, we have the, the same formula, and we did take a look at the 10 years. But what about the growth of the balance? We did start with 800 right in the beginning, time zero. And uh, then we got the 1,573 at the end of uh, year 10. So as we see, it grew almost $800, dollars let's say. And that's not bad. But what if you let that money sit for a while between year 40 and year 50? Well, after 40 years, notice the only change is we've changed the exponent. 1.07 is raised to the 40th power. That's much more than doubling. <laughs> now we're up to about 12000 for our first number. But even better than that, 50 years goes by and... And we're, we're basically doubling the 40-year mark. So we're talking about big changes. And when you subtract those two numbers, and they include it all the way to the penny, we're up to about $11,600 of a change. And man, is that better than 770 something <laughs> There's just no comparison. So the exponential curve has started off a little on the slow side, but then it starts to go like that almost. I'm exaggerating just a little bit. I've even heard it called a J-curve, although that's not really done that way in math circles, but it does seem to go pretty steeply. It's just a matter of how long you want to wait for it. But they're saying it's about 15 times the growth over the first 10 years, so that's quite a change, if you ask me. All right, so now we have another example. Suppose a certain job opportunity offers a starting salary of 50000 includes a 5% salary raise each year. And evaluating this opportunity, you may wish to know what your salary might be after 15 years. So say maybe you're not thrilled with 50, but you want to see what would happen after a while. So instead of a 7% raise, we're getting a 5% raise. And 5% is 0.05 added to the 1, or 5% added to the 100%. So they, they did it that way first, and then they're going to divide by 100 to get the factor of 1.05. And so let me get a working pen. I've got two of them. And this has been multiplied by the current salary. So I'll put a little dot there. <laughs> They've got the little times mark there. So multiply 1.05. And so for one year, you'd get 100% more. That's going to be whatever it works out to be. But we're more interested in getting into an exponential formula. And so instead of just doing one year, which would be relatively easy, uh, we get the initial value times the base to the t power, just like before. But now, 50,000 is the initial value, and 1.05 is being raised to the t power. So we put all that together, and then finally, after the formula's been 
amount it, uh, written down. We do have 15 that goes in, in for the T. And of course, we're going to have to calculate that number first. 1.05 to the 15th power. Do that first. However your calculator does it, you have to find out how your calculator works. And that's a number that's, that's quite a bit larger than I, I would have thought. But it's uh, 2.0789, let's say. More than double. And uh, we have 50,000 more than doubled. As you then multiply the number that you find in your calculator by 50,000, you get to 103,900 something. More than double. And uh, the key observations of this example are that the salary is an exponential function, and the base corresponding to 5% is 1.05. So yes, we have to keep that in mind. We're going to be doing this in Chapter 4 also. A common error would be to assume the 5% raise for 15 years is just 15 times 5 or 75% raise. But that's not true. That just isn't true. <laughs> the actual raise is much more. So that's the problem with that. It's going to be not a 75% raise, it's more like a 100, 100 plus percent raise. I'll put it that way. I don't feel like calculating it out. But if it was $100,000, it would be exactly double, which you remember is a 100% raise. It's just like a tripling is a 200% raise. And there is one homework problem on that. The uh, syllabus is now available in Blackboard, and also the first couple of assignments are available for you in WebAssign. So go ahead and start looking at them, uh, and we'll have more comments on that as we go along. Exponential growth, uh, well, quantity grows exponentially when it increases by a constant percentage, or even just a constant factor, if you'd rather use that term, over a given period. <clears throat> so R is the percentage growth per period, and the base of the exponential function is 1 plus R. And, uh, or it could be the proportional growth. Actually, there's proportional growth. They kind of made a slight mistake there, so let me uh, X that out just a little bit. But it, it does reflect the growth, and they've already decided to put it into a decimal, decimal form. So 5% would be 0 0.05, 7% would be 0 0.07. So it's not exactly percentage growth, so that's slightly off by a bit. But anyway, the base is always greater than 1 for exponential growth. Greater, so it won't be smaller. So we have initial value times 1 plus r to the t. And that is a formula that we're going to be seeing again. This is the beginnings of the Chapter 4 formulas, some of which are moderate like this, and some are much more involved than, than that. So we want to kind of go from right to left. We want to see what the amount would be based on the initial value. So this is the starting point, and we throw a factor in that increases it, and it grows, typically a savings account. And yes, as we just mentioned, the growth starts slowly and increases rapidly at some point, depending on your definition of that. So let's see, it looks like I have to do this by hand now. Um, okay, here's an example, very miniaturized. I don't know why it's so small. Um, U.S. healthcare expenditures in 2010 reached about two and a half trillion dollars, and it's they say it's difficult to predict future healthcare costs, and especially with the advent of the Affordable Care Act, apparently it just adds volatility, which means it's unpredictable. Um, one prediction is in the near term it would grow by about six and a half percent each year. So let's just throw that in and see what happens. And this was, of course, 11-year-old uh, data now, but. Uh, Anyway, if this growth rate did continue that way, find a first of all a formula that gives the expenditures as a function of time, and if it were continue to be true all the way to 2030, what would then happen? So whatever letter you use for the left part of the formula is up to you. They chose H here. I don't know where. H for health care, I guess. So initial value times 1 plus the decimal, not percentage, but decimal that gets attached to that, such as a 1.05 or whatever, raised to the T power in terms of years. And so we start off in terms of trillions of dollars. Yes, we did speak about that. That's 10 to the 12th, but we're not going to worry about that. That's just pushed to the side. It's just what we're talking about. So the 2.47 is all we need. Don't worry about 10 to the 12th. That's not a, a big deal. Everything stays in trillions. And so 6.5% is equal to 0.065. Add it to the 1, and you're going to get 1.065. And of course, that will be eventually raised to the T power. 2.47 will be multiplied by that number. <coughs> and the formula starts off with a T, and then because 2030 is 20 years later after the original number, original time, 2010, we put the 20 power in, 
course, do the exponent first, then multiply by 2.47. That's quite important because there's a certain number of people that will not do that correctly. That number I already calculated is around, I don't know, 7.9, something like that. Let me do that really quick right now while I have time. 1.065 raised to the 20th. That number is about a 3.5. So multiply that number in your calculator, no need to round, by 2.47, and you get, oh, it's, I'm sorry, 8.7, $8.7 trillion. And the next sketch will show you that. <coughs> Years since 2010, which is the prediction they're making. So there's the 20th year, and that does look like around an 8.7 right there. So it's less than $9 trillion. <laughs> So where would we be here? 14. I don't know what the actual numbers are, but that would be right around 6. And I have no idea. I haven't kept up with this at all, so I don't know what the current expenditures actually are. But there are many assumptions made in models. Some are not meant to be totally accurate because they're just doing the best they can with unpredictable data. And other times they are very precise and it shows up in their work later on. And they, they got it right because they're always checking their work after the real data comes in. Now, we're not going to spend quite as much time on exponential decay, but we need to at least talk about it because it's practically the same subject. It's hardly any difference at all. But we're talking about stuff that decays, such as, oh, I don't know, population shrinkage <laughs> or carbon-14 dating. They, they have a picture in your book. Uh, I don't know if you have that part of it. i maybe show it to you, but they talk about the amount of carbon-14 that's still left inside various things and uh, they can actually find out how much there is and then backtrack it from the formula to see about how old a material would be whether it's thousands of years old or whatever and they're not going to pinpoint the exact day of course but they'll get to within a few hundred years I'm sure anyway they use exactly the same formula there's only one difference that minus sign there Instead of a plus R, it's a minus R. So this is just saying that the number you're going to be multiplying by is less than 1. If the number is greater than 1, the exponential function goes up. And this, I don't know why this disappears, but there we go. So that would be your increasing. But if the number is less than 1, then it's just the other way around. It may not be that abrupt, but it'll be headed downwards, headed towards 0 at some point. And if it's exactly one, not much is going on. It's very boring. It's just a flat line. <laughs> so we never use one. One would be say that there's no change at all. And so there's nothing to see here. It's just super boring. <laughs> so anyway, T is the number of periods. Could be years, could be months. That should be specified. Could be hours, depending on what it is. So exponential decay starts off rapidly at first, but then eventually slows. It's just the, the exact reverse of what we had. And these are, of course, for your R or for your quantity, 1 minus R to be more specific. 1 minus R to be less than 1 and 1 minus R to be either greater or lesser than 1. So let's go to the next slide and see an example or two. After antibiotics are administered, the concentration in the bloodstream declines over time. It starts to wear off. So if you've had 70 milligrams of amoxicillin injected, the amount of drug in the bloodstream declines by 49% each hour. So it's cut about in half each time. It's a little bit too close to the half-life in my opinion, but that's just the example they gave us. So find a formula that gives the amount of the drug uh, in the bloodstream as a function of the time since the injection. And we're talking hours here. So that's going to be your clue as far as the time used. So another injection will be required when it declines to 10. And we can answer that question as well. But what they are really only after here is do we need it at the five hour mark or not? And later on, we can get more specific just based on the graph. But uh, let's take a look at what's going on here. Instead of adding a number to the one, we subtract it from the one. Of course, it can never go below zero. <laughs> it can't even go to zero, actually. But uh, anyway, this R will be some number that still leaves a positive number, but it's less than one. So it's going to be shrinking as you start putting exponents on it uh, instead of growing like it would be. So the base of the exponential function is actually 0.51. In other words, a little bit more than half is staying every hour. And the initial value is 70, so that's the number we're going to start with is 70. 
and it will be multiplied by 1 minus r to the t instead of 1 plus r to the t. So we've already calculated that in advance, so there's your 0.51 to the t power. And after five hours, we see that you raise this to the fifth power. Let's just see what that is, 0.51 to the 5. 0.51 raised to the 5. By itself, that number is a 0 0.0345. You multiply that by 70, and yes, you do get approximately 2.4 milligrams. And yeah, that's less than 10. So something bad is happening here. <laughs> they need to have that amount of moxicillin for various treatments. And another injection would be needed before the five hour mark. Now here's the picture. And uh, at the five hour mark, we see that that was at around 2.4, pretty much a fourth of the way between the zero and the 10. This is a very small picture. So try to increase the size of this a little bit. What about the 10 mark? We're interested in that, so let's see where that would be. That would be just a little bit before the three hour mark. So definitely around two and a half, two and three quarter, but definitely between two and a half and three hours, that's when the injection should be. So the wait five is not good. Hopefully the patient is still alive or whatever it might be. So let's, let's see if we can move that along there. As we include this relatively short lesson, apparently, we talk about something that's a little too close to the last example, in my opinion, because now half-life says we'll get rid of half of it each time a certain period goes along. Now, I don't know what that period would be. Maybe it's an hour. Maybe it's a millennium. We just have to be specific about what the time unit would be. And they're talking especially concerning a radioactive substance, although it does pertain to other things as well. But this is the primary use of what's called the half-life. And we're not going to see a great deal of this, but it does tie right into the subject material. It's the time it takes for half of the substance to decay. So half of it to go, we need to find out how much time that is, and that will be part of our formula. So after H half-lives, the amount of radioactive substance remaining is given by the exponential formula which thing that got cut off, unfortunately. I'm not sure why that, that goes that way, but the amount remaining would be the initial amount times one half to the t power. So let's just make it easy. Let's try t equals one. That is exactly one half life. So they would have the initial amount. Let's just say it's 100. I don't know what it is, but let's just say it's 100. So it would be amount remaining would equal 100 times one half to the one power, but the one would disappear. We don't care about a one power very much, so it'd simply be half of 100. So that is your original half-life. But as I continue, I make t equal two. How about two time periods? Then we would have it equal to 100 times one-half squared. But one-half squared is one-fourth, or 0.25, if you'd rather say it that way. And the point is we're down to 25 or a fourth a fourth of it so it's like two halves it doesn't go to zero it just takes half of a half and the next to be an eighth the next to be a sixteenth i think you see the pattern coming from that so now various values of t can come in and and see what happens so if they're if we're talking about years we can talk about t years by first expressing t in terms of half lives and then using the formula above so this is uh, something we'll explain here on the next slide and as I increase the size just a little bit here, the carbon-14 in this organism decays with a half-life of 5,770 years. That is a lot. Suppose a tree contains C sub-zero grams of carbon-14 when it was cut down. Now, they didn't even specify what that was, but uh, anyway, we'll just call that C sub-zero for now. Zero is like the starting point. And what percentage of the original amount of carbon-14 would be fined if it was cut down 30,000 years ago? So we can actually calculate that by looking at the following. The amount C remaining after H half-lives, and they're going to uh, use H instead of T. So there's a little switch here. H is kind of replacing the T. <laughs> So it was the same as T from before, but so we're still going to use the core of the formula here, one half raised to the H power. So each half life, and we're just going to call it H for half life now. So they're going to say that we start at 5770 equaling one half life. So to get how many half lives involved in 30,000 years, 
Well, if it had been exactly 6,000 years, it would have been exactly five half-lives, because 30,000 divided by 6,000 is five. But it's not exactly that. It turns out it's 5.20 half-lives, because it's a slightly less time period than 6,000. So that's where the exponent comes in, 5.20 half-lives. And that means that one half will be raised to that power, which makes a very small number. And C0 is not even specified. They decided not to put anything in. They could have called it 100. They could have called it 1,000. Who knows? But that, they're just going to kind of almost ignore that part of it. And they could have just called it C, I suppose. But uh, they're going to call it C sub 0 because that's the original value of C. So that, that does make some sense. The point is it's down to about 2.7% of the original amount. So, yeah, 2.7% as we quickly convert this to percentage, and I know you can do that, it's just move the decimal over two spots, and you get 2.7 with the new decimal place, stick a percent sign on, because you have converted to percent. They're not the same, of course. So we'd have the original amount of uh, carbon-14 remaining after 30,000 years, after 2.7% of the original amount is there. So uh, that's not very much, so one half to the uh, second power we already said was one-fourth. So one-half to the third power is one-eighth, about 12.5%. One-half to the fourth power is one-sixteenth, which is around, what, 6%. One-half to the fifth power, I'm just carrying this out, is one over 32, which is around 3%. And this is even more than that, so it's a little less than 3%. So that's where that came from, and that's how they can kind of backtrack uh, how much is involved. So they measure carefully the carbon-14. and the other slide that I didn't include this time actually shows a little bit more about that. But that's l relatively minor use of the exponential formula, but uh, once again, the college algebra class spends a great deal of time talking about the growth of the decay with many, many examples. And uh, here we're just going to give you a brief example about the half-life and a little bit about the decay. Uh, so a couple of examples there at the end, but it looks like probably the more interesting part of it for us would be as far as interest is concerned whether you're paying the interest or whether the bank is collecting the interest from a mortgage uh, we're more interested in the growth pattern so that's why I'm kind of focusing on the growth and this chapter four is almost completely concerned with the growth so that's uh, why I want to emphasize that I noticed that in the original homework assignment they had like seven out of the ten problems they were on decay and that just didn't help us that much. I, I left a couple of them in there, but primarily we're looking at exponential growth. And you know, a savings account is a perfect example. Uh, you just let it sit there and it grows and grows and grows. The mortgage, however, you're paying the money or credit card debt, you're paying the money and uh, they're collecting the money. So it's still a plus. It isn't like it's decaying, not really. So the decay is more of a non-business, non-personal finance type of calculation. So I'm not saying we'll never see it again, but the growth is a lot more important in this class. So I did want to provide some examples of both, but yet the growth is where we're headed in chapter four. So it looks like we're sizing up 3.2 pretty well, and it uh, looks like the next live lecture will undoubtedly go into chapter four a little bit, not the hard part of chapter four, and we'll try to sprinkle in some Excel. Um, I haven't decided whether I'm going to have Excel lectures separate from Chapter 4, but they should be basically in tandem because Chapter 4 is the heaviest user by far of the Excel stuff. So I'll try to present them together as best I can. So maybe one day I'll be Excel, one day I'll be Chapter 4. Well, we'll figure it out. Uh, last time I, I'm going to change it from what I did last time I taught the class. But it looks like we're coming towards the end of it. It's been, uh, as I record this on Friday, Friday evening now that it's gotten dark. It's been a very cold day, high in the 40s, over an inch of rain. Uh, winter is definitely here. It's supposed to be more rain on Tuesday. And I won't see you again live until Wednesday or Thursday because this does comprise the Monday or Tuesday class depending on what section you're in. I've got two sections each day. So uh, you, know, you can figure out what section you're in. And uh, once this gets downloaded, I'm not sure if it'll be today or on Saturday, but obviously you're watching it now because it, you've got to check out the YouTube videos for which many of the first half of the week lectures will be recorded either Monday, Tuesday, but some will be live. So I will always announce them when they're live coming up, but uh, either Wednesday or Thursday should always be live. That, that's going to be the policy we could try to adhere to this time the best we can. 
Okay, I think that's going to do it for today. I don't know how long this went, but I don't tend to go 75 minutes with these very often, rarely if ever. And uh, so have a nice rest of the day, and we'll see you live on Wednesday or Thursday. And we will have office hours also. So, all right, talk to you soon.